This is um, uh, the uh, se second of a series of four workshops. Uh, and in the first workshop, we introduced the idea of uh, competency standards and how they relate to assessment strategies and systems. Um, and we, we plan a recap in relation to that. Um, but it would be interesting to know how many of you attended the first session uh, because that would impact on the extent to which we need to go back through those issues. But certainly it's part of our agenda and it's really a question of whether we spend a, a fair bit of time on that or whether we accelerate through that as we go through today. I mentioned that this is part of a four-part series. Uh, the third part deals with the making of judgments and that won't be until next year. Sounds a bit scary, doesn't it, that uh, we're talking about uh, uh, February next year. Uh, and there will also be a fourth session uh, later on in the in next year. So that the, we, you need to see this as a part of a four-part series. Also next year in February, there will be a session specifically looking at RPL. Uh, recognition of prior learning will be touched on today, only very briefly, uh, but there is a session devoted to recognition of prior learning uh, that we'll be looking at in uh, February next year. So we have quite a, a, a range of uh, objectives in terms of our uh, session today. Uh, primarily though, uh, if we look at the next slide, we'll see uh, that we're going to start off with a, a, a recap of uh, what we dealt with in the first session. And looking at the poll that has just been done, I think we do need to spend a little bit of time on the recap to make sure that um, uh, we are working from, I think the classical line is the same hymn sheet um, and have the same sort of concepts of competency uh, as we move through those uh, following issues. And the following issues are assessing knowledge and, and in that we'll talk about what uh, why knowledge is part of a, of a competency. Indeed there was a time when it was thought that competencies did not involve knowledge. We very quickly realised that people who could, could do things but didn't know what they were doing uh, were fairly useless. So knowledge was brought back into the concept of competency and plays a very significant and powerful role in that area. Uh, we look then at assessing skills, uh, the process of observing a person performing the skills associated with the competency, uh, and then look at the other components of, of uh, the unit of competency and the components of an assessment tool. Uh, so that we start then looking at some exemplars, not necessarily uh, a best practice, but rather the sorts of things that you could include within the, within a, a knowledge assessment tool and the sorts of things you could include in a, in a skills assessment tool. Uh, and then move into the, the formal sort of process of design, which involves mapping uh, tools uh, and uh, against the unit requirements and going backwards and forwards as you so that you gradually achieve harmony between the way you're assessing and what the unit of competency requires. And then we'll finish off with a three uh, short um, uh, discussions about uh, specific issues when it comes to assessment. Uh, the first one being clustered assessment when we are dealing with uh, units of competency that we are teaching and assessing together in a cluster. What does that mean when it comes to assessment and assessment tools? A reasonable adjustment, which looks at the issue of individuals who present with a disability um, and to what extent can we make an adjustment? The word reasonable within the context of this is really important. Uh, and then finally, a recognition of prior learning, which as I uh, said before, is a targeted topic for a later workshop, but we will address it today because RPL is, is part of um, the whole sort of context of assessment within, within VET. So we have uh, for today a comprehensive uh, set of subjects to address. Uh, and you will find at the end of um, uh, the session, we'll also talk about resources that you can access. And indeed, there are substantial resources, including uh, uh, the, the standards themselves, uh, and we'll be referring to the standards as we go. Uh, there's a guide to the standards, which TAC publishes, uh, which provides you with detailed information about uh, each standard and, and each clause within the standard and why it is important. Uh, and then there are a series of fact sheets, many of which relate to assessment in one way or another. And so we'll be referring to those uh, later on as we go. Uh, 
Today's session, uh, I'll be of course referring, as you can see on the slide, to particular clauses. So the slide you see there today mentions uh, clause 1.8. When we're talking about a clause and a part of the standards, we're talking about something that is mandatory. Uh, there's no negotiation on that. It's in the standards. It's something you must do. But we'll also be providing advice and guidance, very much as the fact sheets do as well. Um, to say, well, look, uh, there are a number of ways in which you can do it. This is one way it can be done. Uh, and so when we're providing you with guidance and advice, we'll try to make sure that it's clear to you uh, that we're not mandating that particular strategy. We're saying this is a strategy that works. Uh, and you may well have other strategies that you would like to deploy uh, to achieve the same outcomes. So we'll try and, as best we can to make it clear where something is mandated and where something is advice or guidance or a jolly good idea. And I might say that I'm very fortunate to be working as an auditor with TAC uh, because I get to meet lots of really interesting people doing really interesting things in really interesting ways. Um, so I know I'm a sort of a bit like a magpie scrounging bits and pieces from everywhere, but I learn a lot from what people do. Uh, and I guess I might say that I learn about things that go wrong. Uh, but I also learned about things that go right. And so these sessions provide an opportunity uh, to share with you uh, some of those ideas. I wouldn't necessarily put it down as wisdom. It's more often just experience. Um, but to share that with you means that hopefully you can um, channel your pathway through to effective assessment strategies uh, by thinking about the issues that we raised today. To make sure though that we're working from the, from the, with the same ideas, uh, we want to do a bit of a recap and I want to draw your attention to the uh, pre-reading um, material that you have available to you. Um, and if you skip from page one, which talks a bit about the, uh, the, the workshop in context of other workshops, and you can see at the top of that page uh, the list of four workshops that I referred to before. Um, and you'll also see on that page some references and resources, and we'll come back to those a bit later on, but you'll see that many of them are indeed fact sheets. Um, uh, we need then to go on to page two, which starts with that sort of almost silly question, which is why is, does assessment matter? Uh, and indeed there, there have been, I used to work in education in schools and people used to talk about grading being degrading and assessment, you know, teaching for assessment and how bad assessment was. And you even had a circumstances where schools decided that they wouldn't assess at all because it was so dangerous and harmful. Uh, in our game, in VET, assessment is a key thing. It's not something that uh, is a sort of an optional extra. It is something that is core to the business of, of RTOs, because at the end of the day, you need to be able to make a judgment and make a declaration that an individual has achieved the competency standards that are relevant to the needs of industry so that that person uh, can go into the workplace and perform those competencies to their own benefit, to the benefit of the employer, to the benefit of the economy, to the benefit of the community. Um, and that means that you are making, when you make a, an assessment judgment, uh, a, a really profound statement, uh, a statement that impacts on that individual's future life and and the safety of the workplace. Uh, and, the, and you're making a, a statement that can impact on, uh, on the community more broadly. So you need to get that statement right. You need to be confident that when you declare a person to be competent, that they truly are competent. And so on the top of page two, uh, you'll find a kind of little line of argument which basically says your job is to assess a person's competencies. Um, that judgment of competency needs to be made by someone like yourself who is qualified as an assessor. And indeed, you'll notice that in the VET standards, uh, clauses 113 through to 116 in particular, refer to the qualities of being a VET assessor. A VET trainer as well, of course, but being a VET assessor specifically there. Uh, and that basically means that when a person is charged with the responsibility of making this judgment, they're doing so on the basis of being themselves strongly credentialed, both in terms of the vocational side of things, um, the, that is the subject matter that you're teaching and the skills that you're teaching, uh, and from the point of view of being a vet practitioner. Uh, 
Uh, and that makes a very strong statement. And it's not something you see in other sectors. You do not have to be qualified as an assessor to teach at university or to assess at university, or for that matter, in schools. But in the vet sector, because the judgment you're making is so profound, it really is important that you have those credentials behind you. Um, the judgment itself that you make must be valid, reliable, fair, and flexible. And we'll come back to those words in a moment. But you can see there that it's basically saying um, there's a, there are quality requirements of judgment uh, that we must consider. But the judgment must be based on evidence, and we're an evidence. Uh, vet, and under those circumstances, there are rules for evidence, and those rules, again, which we'll touch on again briefly, uh, are fundamentally uh, validity, sufficiency, currency, and authenticity. Uh, and, and that has a big impact on what we're talking about today, because when we talk about assessment tools, we need to know that those tools are going to gather evidence that is valid, sufficient, current, and authentic. And, uh, and finally, the final line on the top of page two uh, says that uh, you are accountable for the judgments you make. And again, this is something unique to the vet sector uh, because there are clearly defined standards, uh, because there are within the terms of what you're teaching and, uh, and what you're assessing, and there are clearly defined standards in terms of how you teach and how you assess the standards for RTOs. Uh, then um, you are accountable for the judgments you make. If you make a wrong judgment uh, and the consequence of that is some harm occurs in, uh, with that individual or that individual harms others or damages a business and so on, then the question can legitimately ask, who said this person was competent? Who said this person could be employed in this role? Uh, and it comes back to the assessor uh, to justify the judgment they made. So we need to think very carefully at this point about the quality of the evidence you gather, which leads to the quality of the judgment you make, which leads in turn to the quality of performance of that individual when they leave your care and become part of the workforce. Uh, so it's not a game, it's very serious business. And the fact that it's very serious business is backed up by the fact that we do have training packages which set standards <laughs> we do have uh, RTO standards that define standards for RTOs to operate. Uh, we do have credential requirements that mean that those involved in the process themselves as individuals must have strong credentials uh, to be able to carry out that role. Uh, though, so we have on the one hand quite strict conditions in terms of outcomes and we have on the other hand uh, supporting structures which make sure that those strict conditions can be met. So you can see that when we talk about this whole issue of designing assessment tools uh, and, uh, and utilising assessment tools, we are talking about this very a serious topic. What we're measuring with those assessment tools, of course, is competency. Uh, and competency is a quality which is defined in the standards themselves as the consistent application of knowledge and skill to the standard of performance required in the workplace and it embodies the ability to transfer and apply skills and knowledge to new situations and environments. And when you look at the key words in that definition, you can see that they have a lot to say about how we assess and the evidence we need to gather. So, for example, the first one of the early words is consistent. You can't judge consistency with a one-shot assessment. That implies that we need to gather evidence on more than one occasion. Now, most units of competency these days do actually suggest that you assess more than once, but some still say at least once, um, and, uh, and good practice would argue that at least once means at least twice. <laughs> uh, and we'll come back to that issue a bit later on too, but the, fundamentally, you can't judge consistency from a single assessment. Uh, application basically means that you uh, must be assessing and gathering evidence in a context which is like the real workplace, because we want to know, can they apply this? We don't want to know just do they know it? Can they recite it? Can they pretend to do it? We want to know, can they actually apply this comp competency? Uh, it talks about knowledge, and so we, as we've mentioned before, we need to understand that knowledge is an important part of being a competent person, and skill, which is the, the core of the concept of competency, that the person can perform a skill not just in, in a kind of repetitive way, but with knowledge backing up that performance. 
And all of this has to happen to a workplace standard. So we need to continually reference both within ourselves and with, through the standards what happens in workplaces so that our assessments reflect workplaces. If they don't reflect workplaces, then we can't make a reasonable inference that what we are seeing on campus is going to really mean something when they go out into the world of work. And then finally, it has those words transfer and apply to the new situations, which again tells us we need to assess more than once because we don't know if a person can transfer a competency across a range of contexts unless we assess over a range of contexts. Uh, and they need to be new situations, which means it's not just them repeating what you've shown them, but that they are challenged, as they will be in the workplace when they leave the training environment, uh, they are challenged to deal with new situations. So you can see in that definition of competency, which comes from the standards themselves, um, uh, that uh, the, uh, there are important messages about how we need to gather evidence and what kind of evidence we need to gather. And we'll come back to those points later on, but we'll, when we get to them, we'll be talking about how you can assess more than once, uh, how you can make sure that you, the skills are being assess, assessed within an op, uh, a context which reflects application uh, within a workplace, how you can focus on knowledge and how you can focus on skill. All these things uh, will be seen as embedded, if you like, in the way we design our assessment tools and the way we design our, assess, uh, our plan our assessment processes. Uh, when you look at the unit of competency itself, and we're now looking at the bottom of page three, you'll see that there are a whole bunch of dot points there that reflect what sort of content you'll find in the unit of competency. So you'll find that it may refer to prerequisite units, and if it does, then although you don't have to gather evidence about those prerequisite units again, uh, you certainly do need to gather evidence that the prerequisite unit has been done, which is largely an administrative exercise, unless, of course, you are clustering the prerequisite with the unit itself. Um, there must be elements of competency, but you'll notice that I've put in the same line and their performance criteria, because elements of competency are defined by their performance criteria, and so you can't measure performance criteria in isolation from each other. Uh, you must be able to say uh, that all the performance criteria for this element have been seen together, not in separate little assessments. And, and so we put that in one line. Elements of competency and their performance criteria is one line because it's one thing. Uh, foundation skills, and they are not always foundation skills. Uh, well, maybe there are always foundation skills, but in many cases they're not listed. Uh, because they are integrated and, and, and implicit within the performance criteria themselves. But where the foundation skills are not implicitly expressed through the performance criteria, then they may be listed as separate entities and those two must be assessed, otherwise you cannot say a person is truly competent. There will be performance evidence which talks about how many times you need to assess, what sort of, what sort of assessment uh, uh, processes might be involved, uh, uh, and it might in some cases uh, it, recite the, the elements again, but now talking much more about how performance is to be seen in relation to those elements. And then you'll find knowledge evidence, which is usually a list of knowledge items, and we'll come back to how you interpret that list in a little while. And finally, assessment conditions, which might talk about uh, whether or not um, simulation is acceptable or role plays or case studies uh, or a, a, a might also indicate that there needs to be workplace assessment involved and workplace hours. Uh, and it might also talk about the requirements, sometimes special requirements of assessors. Uh, so you'll find that within the unit of competency, it's not really encoded, it's not really encrypted, it's really quite blatantly there. Uh, all the requirements that you need to make sure make up your assessment process. We looked about that looked at that last time under the sort of rubric of the set designing an assessment system, but we need now to make sure that we have, when we start talking about assessment tools, assessment tools that reflect those requirements and address all those requirements. So that as we will see in our next session, when we look at assessment judgment, that we have all the evidence we need to be able to make a meaningful judgment. On page four, 
Uh, there's, a, again, a bit more of a recital about the various components of a unit of competency, but I just want to highlight the word application. Uh, and an application is, uh, is a paragraph or two written early in the unit of competency, which talks about how the unit of competency is applied in the workplace. Uh, a lot of people, I think, jump right over that and go straight to the elements and performance criteria. <clears throat> but I read the application because it's talking about this competency is used in the workplace. And there it might talk about the extent to which the person needs to be supervised, to whom are they reporting, who reports to them. Uh, that will have an impact on how you assess and the design of the assessment tools, because you'll need to make sure that what you do is replicate that application in your uh, assessment processes. So don't ignore the section in the unit of competency discussing application. Have very really really uh, important uh, implications for how you assess. Finally, um, there uh, in the document we re we deal in a bit in detail with the principles of assessment and the rules of evidence, and that's on pages five and six. Uh, and the principles of assessment uh, can be seen as uh, talking about the kind of uh, overall general conditions of assessment. So it talks about flexibility and fairness. Flexibility basically says, look, there are lots of ways you can get evidence. You might be able to get evidence through simulation. You might be able to get evidence through <coughs> uh, workplace observation. You might be able to get evidence in a number of different ways. And so being flexible and fair means that you can adapt what you do uh, to meet that. From the point of view of, uh, of a vet regulator, we need to know that you have at least one mechanism for gathering evidence in relation to an individual's performance with respect to a unit of competency, because we need to know that you can service the needs of your students. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you are locked into that. Being flexible and fair means that if a student presents with evidence of another kind or, or, or it provides you with access to evidence sources that you hadn't predicted when you did your initial planning, that you're able to, in fact, adopt that. So Mel's got a question. Um, and Jerry is, say, basically asking a question, when a UOC is assessed, as a unit of competency is assessed, judgments are made to be either satisfactory or not. To put it simply, there are RTOs that have 100% pass mark attached to the assessments for units of competency. As an example, maths unit of competency utilising several assessments are assessed at 100%. Um, so the, the, fundamentally what we're talking about here is the fact that um, 100% uh, within this context means that every single attribute of a unit of competency must be seen. We'll come back to that question about how often that needs to be seen 100% of the time right. But you must be able to say, when you say a person is competent, that they have achieved every quality of that competency that is set down in the standards. Um, and so the concept of 100% in a sense would rather not talk about 100% because that assumes that there's some sort of marking system. There isn't really a marking system. There's a checking off system where you basically say, can I check off that I've seen every one of these qualities, every element because I've seen every performance criterion, every bit of knowledge, every performance evidence requirement and so on. Can I check those off? Max, though, is asking another question. Max Martin is, how about the push for a six-month duration? Uh, Max, um, um, Mark, I should say, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by the question. Um, uh, so I, you might want to, to put a little bit more information in there. Do you, are you talking about um, uh, six months uh, life of a certificate? Uh, I'm not too sure what you're talking about when you talk about six month duration. So Mark, if you'd like to add a little bit more detail to your question, I think I can uh, probably respond to it. Going back to the principles of assessment then, fairness and flexibility means that we can um, make uh, some choices about how we assess depending on the needs and, and opportunities provided by the learner. Uh, validity though overrides everything and that is that we cannot be so flexible and fair uh, that we are invalid. We can't say, oh, well, we'll leave this bit off or put that bit in um, because that's what uh, information I have available to me. Uh, and so we, uh, picking up Jerry's uh, point, 
Uh, we need 100% of the evidence that's needed. Uh, validity requires that when we make an assessment judgment, we are doing so because we have 100% of or everything that, that is required to be seen. Um, validity also means that we need to be confident that we are in fact assessing within the context of something that is at least like a workplace. Uh, so there will, those issues will pick up again when we are starting to talk very specifically about knowledge assessment and skills assessment. And reliability basically says, which is the fourth of the uh, principles of assessment, uh, basically says um, uh, that, um, thanks Mel, uh, that, um, uh, that we need to have marking guides or some other way of making sure that both ourselves are, we are internally consistent in, in our observations and judgments and that we are consistent with our fellow lecturers and assessors when it comes to our judgments of assessment. Mark uh, has added a little bit here, the push for training assessment over six months, such as in the release, re recently uh, TLI packages. Uh, look, so Mark, I'm gonna make a terrible confession here. I'm not aware that there's been a push for um, these things to be over six months. Um, uh, we have this concept within the standards of the amount of training, which basically says that sometimes training will take longer because uh, the individual needs more time, and sometimes training will take a shorter time, down to actually zero for recognition of prior learning, uh, because uh, an individual may be, able, may be able to demonstrate competence in a much shorter time. Uh, we are driven in the VET sector by outcomes, not by inputs. So in the traditional education, um, we talk about how long a course is. We don't define the exit standard, but we do define how long the training will be. In the VET sector, we don't define the length of training. Uh, we, we define the outcome, which is the competency. To achieve that outcome will, will involve an amount of training, which will vary according to the student's uh, qualities, uh, and the conditions and indeed our own resources. Uh, so we are asked in our training and assessment strategies in standard one and 1.1 and 1.2 to talk about the amount of training. But there's no fixed amount of training. What we are asking you to do in those standards, in those clauses, is to think about how much time it will take uh, and how much engagement will, will be involved for each learner um, to be able to get to the the outcome, which is the competency itself. Uh, and so with RPL, there is no amount of training, uh, six months wouldn't apply. It simply says, if you're ready to be assessed now, then we'll assess you now. And that's what RPL basically does. And we'll come back to that also later on. But there'll be other students who will take longer. The problem with that mo model is that um, there's a push then not so much to go out to six months, but to reduce the time. It becomes a competitive thing between RTOs to reduce the amount of training again and again and again uh, in order to outcompete um, other providers. And so we have a, a, a push um, to say we should set minimum times. The, the problem, as I said before, is that those minimum times may not apply to certain learners and certain circumstances under which, uh, 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 in, the, in the, that sort of situation, you might well say, well, we have to have a, a, a get out clause, which enables us to say, well, normally it would take six months, but other times it may take more time and in other circumstances it may take less. Uh, so we have a, have a, a, a bit of a, an ongoing challenge when it comes to duration, amount of training, uh, and, uh, and the sort of concepts of VET, which is outcome focused rather than input focused. I don't know, I, I don't know Mark, whether I've um, responded appropriately to that, uh, but, but we are in a, a state of flux at the moment. There's a lot of reviews and going on in relation to the AQF and in relation to the standards for RTOs and in relation to training packages and training products. Um, there is some of that old school thinking still kicking around which says it's not what you can do but how long it took you to do it. Um, and we still need to convince people that um, 
it's not about duration of time or amount of training, but about the outcome of the, of the assessment process, which makes today's session all the more important because to be able to say that time doesn't matter um, means can only be said if we trust our assessments, if we make good assessments. If that process of shortening the training time uh, is, uh, means that the assessments are going to be chonky or less than adequate, uh, then that's very dangerous territory to go into. If the assessments continue to be high quality and rigorous, uh, our subject for today, if they continue to be high quality and rigorous, then shortening the time will simply mean more people fail. Um, and the uh, RTO will lose its competitive advantage and will need to expand its training so that its students pass. I use the word pass and fail in the sort of general sense that they achieve or don't achieve the unit of competency. Uh, so it really is important that we get the assessments right because that gives us the freedom then to be more flexible and fair in relation to the duration of training. Finally, on pages uh, six and seven, it just reflects on three points that we've made uh, in the previous session. The first, that our assessment tools must reflect industry practice. Uh, and that's part of the, part of the, partly because of the definition of competency, which basically says it's to workplace standards. Uh, now, to reflect industry practice, it means that you as assessors must know about industry practice. And so built into the standards at a number of points, at standard 1.6b, it talks about industry engagement feeding into your current industry skills. And in standard 113b, it talks about your current industry skills. Uh, and so fundamentally what it's saying there is that you need to know about current industry practices because your assessments and indeed your teaching must reflect those. Uh, the second thing that we re reflected on was it needs to reflect what you can do as an RTO. Um, so as an RTO, you need to look at your own resources in terms of workshops and, uh, and uh, practice environments, uh, but also look into the community where you work and identify opportunities for training and assessment within the community itself, within the industry of, of your region. Um, not only does that mean that your training will be reflective of uh, what are the needs in your region, but it'll also mean that what you are doing is consistent with current industry practices. Uh, so what you can do uh, as an RTO is explore your resources, both in the, in the, within the RTO and outside the RTO, and that will have an impact on how you, you assess and the choices you have for assessment. And finally, um, the point that we made uh, last time was that your assessment tools must be sensitive to the uh, characteristics of your students. Now this, it, it picks up on the flexibility and fairness issue, um, but it is really important always to remember that at the end of the day, there may well be some students who cannot achieve some competencies. Uh, there may be boundaries to their capabilities, which fundamentally means that they can't achieve. Uh, to be flexible and fair is good, uh, but to be invalid is unacceptable. So you have to make sure that that flexibility and fairness um, is uh, reasonable but rather than unreasonable, and that's something we're going to touch on uh, much later on uh, this morning. So you can see from our program uh, today and that recap that when we start thinking about uh, assessment, uh, then there are some very fundamental requirements we need to have. And I've tried to encapsulate them in this slide, uh, but I do want to say that we'll come back to this slide a bit later on when we get to assessment mapping, when, it come, when we come back to assessment planning, because there are mechanisms that you can use, quite simple mechanisms, to make sure that these uh, principles are indeed addressed. Every requirement of a unit of competency must be addressed. You can't say, oh, I'll leave that bit out because we don't do it, or because it's expensive, or because it's dangerous, or because uh, of whatever reason you might have. Uh, you are required, if you're delivering a unit of competency, to be able to teach and, and most importantly, assess every attribute that that unit of competency requires. Uh, so that is something that is uh, not negotiable, it's, it's fundamental to the standards. You must gather sufficient evidence. 
So you must be confident that the person can has consistency in their performance. In other words, it's not, not a just one, not just a one-shot exhibition of their skill, uh, and that they can transfer. So sufficiency picks up those notions of consistency and transfer. They also pick up that notion of of surety that you know other, you you need to be confident that you are can make a safe judgment about this person's future performance, and that does mean sufficiency is important. You mustn't fragment elements of competency. There's a great danger, and I see this again and again, where people just list the performance criteria and lose the concept of competency, which is that each unit, of, each element of competency is made up of a set of attributes or is identified through a set of attributes, which are the performance criteria for that element. So when you are assessing an element, which is primarily what you're doing with the elements and performance criteria, the performance criteria are there for you to look for qualities of that element. And when you've seen those qualities together, you have seen the element. It's a bit like saying, well, the qualities of a table, which I have in front of me here, are that it has a flat surface and it has legs and, and uh, it has a certain height. Uh, now, what we're, we're talking about there are the qualities of a table. Chairs have legs, but they are not tables because they don't have that specific set of qualities. They do not have a flat surface, but they also have additional qualities such as a back uh, to them, which makes them a chair. Uh, so what you end up with is uh, understanding that it's not about the number of legs in the room if you're counting the tables. Uh, you have to look for the shared attributes of tables, flat tops, and legs. When I've seen those, I can count them and I can say, I have seen in this room five tables. If I'm looking for elements of competency, I want to know, have I seen it? I don't just look for one attribute at a time, one performance criterion at a time, but I look at collections of, of characteristics, which are the performance criteria. So you mustn't fragment an element of competency into its little bits and pieces. You are looking for those performance criteria, but you're looking for them together because what you're actually measuring is the element of competency. Uh, that's what you're looking for. Uh, and that does mean that when it comes to a designing assessment tools, we have to make sure that we do not break elements up into little bits and scatter them across the assessment tools. Because if we do that, we will no longer be seeing those elements and we can make errors of judgment. Uh, then we need to make sure there are no extra requirements being included. It's not uncommon to find trainers and assessors saying, oh, look, you know, that element isn't good enough. Uh, I really think it needs to have this extra stuff. Or there need to be extra elements, or there's extra knowledge I want uh, to be included because I think these are um, important qualities. Well, you might well think they're important qualities, but they are not set down in the standard. And to be rigorous and to be consistent across different RTOs and for industry to understand the judgments we make and to be fair to our students and valid, we must stick to the script and we do not add extra bits in. If you want to ask those questions, by all means do so. If you want to look for those skills, by all means do so, but not under the context of assessing the competency. Uh, because as soon as you do that, then you will uh, alienate some students. So we can't leave anything out and we can't put anything in. We also have to be careful that we're not distracted by irrelevant stuff. You know, should, should the student be wearing a tie? Does that matter? Um, I think it's important so all my students should wear ties. I know that's ridiculous, but the sort of thing that happens quite often when you're dealing with people who are experts is that they notice things that are attributes of themselves rather than things that are attributes of the unit of competency. And it's a bit like adding extra requirements, but these are more unconscious things, not things that you've added in deliberately, but things that you be, become part of your observation and your judgment. So you need to make sure that there's no unrelated evidence coming in uh, that, is, that is going to influence the judgment you make. And finally, they need to make sure you gather the correct type of evidence. And here I'm going out a bit on a limb because I want to say that, that knowledge is assessed one way and skills are assessed a different way and the two are not interchangeable, which takes us to our next slide. And fundamentally, when we look at knowledge, the only way you can really know what a person knows in their head is by asking them questions. A person can perform 
without knowing how they're performing. Uh, and a person could, could make a cake without knowing a recipe. A person could uh, carry out uh, some operation uh, without knowing that they're uh, in, a, in a repetitive way, without knowing uh, the, the significance of the materials that they're working with. Under those sort of circumstances, they would be look like they had the knowledge, but they didn't really have the knowledge at all. So to know if a person has a knowledge, you don't look at the skills, you don't look at their performance of tasks, you ask them questions, directed, focused questions, and that way you can access whether or not they have knowledge. Likewise, skill has to be seen by a person doing something uh, and not inferred from knowledge. A person can know a lot of stuff but not be able to do it. A person can be able to do a lot of stuff and not actually know how they're doing it. So these two things, skills and knowledge, are not interchangeable and are assessed in quite different ways. Uh, and it does mean that you have at least two different way, strategies for assessment every time you're looking at a unit of competency because what you'll be doing is on the one part assessing knowledge, on the other part assessing skills. I don't want you to think that these are, these are in silos, that they are not connected, uh, but what they are is evidenced in different ways. So let's look at knowledge and its function. Uh, as, a, as a starting point. When we're starting to think about the gathering of knowledge, uh, we are going to un need to understand the function of knowledge. But Jerry has asked a question. Just to clarify, I'm in a technical environment dealing with tradespeople. We utilise a couple of training packages, UEE and MEM. As an example, an assessment with 10 maths questions, some with several parts of the question. Should the student fail? to correctly answer the 10 questions, is the result unsatisfactory or is there enough evidence to suggest that perhaps that 100% pass mark is not the best measure of competence? Uh, Jerry, we would need to look, you would, you would need to look at where, where the errors were. Um, so if we're looking at the maths questions, um, uh, to what extent do those errors impact on their, their, their performance in the workplace? Uh, if, if it would lead to incorrect judgments. There was an example, rec not recently, but some time ago, when they were trying to land an, a spacecraft on Mars and the calculations were done in miles per hour instead of kilometres per hour and the thing crashed. Uh, a little error, not very significant, very big impact. Uh, I use the word in every sense of the meaning uh, because they made a little error which led to a huge error in, uh, in judgment and in performance. So the question is not simply 100% or whatever, it's how significant is this error? And that's a judgment you need to be able to make. Uh, so if a person is doing repeated assessments of a particular maths process, let's simplify it and say addition, um, uh, and, and they do get eight of the additions right, is that good enough to be able to operate within the context of a workplace? Or do you need, in this particular workplace with this kind of environment, 100% uh, mastery, never make a mistake? It's a judgment that you have to be able to make. What is not a judgment that you can make is whether or not addition is or is not important. Uh, if addition is listed as a skill a person has to have, then you must assess it and you must be able to show that they can do it. Within the context of addition, how often do they have to get that right? That's a judgment you have to make in terms of what industry needs. And if industry needs perfection, then 100% is the only answer you can accept. Uh, if industry accepts some variation, or if the process itself leads to self-correction, then a little bit of error might be acceptable. So it's a judgment that calls very much upon your industry expertise. Um, uh, if the unit of competency is silent about that, uh, then you are going to have to draw upon your industry expertise uh, to be able to make a call. Um, so um, uh, it's, it's that sort of idea that uh, really is important that we, where if in doubt, reference back to industry. Industry is your master when it comes to training. Uh, you are training people for industry, so you need to know what industry expects and you need to know the risk associated with the judgment you're making. Uh, Nikki has uh, commented here, um, 
in some accredited course, they cover different performance criteria in one element, such as ergonomic requirements and so on. I um, want to basically comment here that uh, it, it, there are times where you will find in a course that the, the unit element of competency has not been written well uh, to pick up on all performance criteria. Uh, and it may be under those circumstances that you will not be able to see all performance criteria at once. Uh, there are a couple of comments we need to comment and make about that. The first is that sometimes a performance criterion is rare or expensive or uh, you know, might be seasonal, uh, it might be even dangerous uh, to observe, in which case we would accept the idea of you asking a what if question instead of actually assessing the performance criterion. What if I was building this fence and there was lightning? You can't simulate that, you can't wait for it to happen and even if it did it'd be too dangerous. So you ask the what if question. Um, uh, it should not have been included as a performance criterion because it is not directly um, observable in a manageable sort of way. But it has been asked for, you can't ignore it, uh, but you can assess that in a slightly different way so that you get some sense of understanding that the person would respond differently in that, in that sort of made up example uh, if they were building a fence in a lightning storm. So fundamentally, uh, we understand that these units of competency and these elements of competency are written by people who don't always get it, uh, in which case you have to um, modify and adjust your assessment and evidence gathering processes to accommodate it. But I will have to say to you that an auditor can legitimately say, why aren't you assessing this uh, along with the other performance criteria? And you need to have the, the, the words to say, there are reasons why I have to assess it this way and explain why you've made a choice to do it in a, in a slightly different way. So what we're saying here is the normal expectation is that an element is always measured as a cohesive collection of performance criteria. But there may be circumstances where a badly written element or where there are some performance criteria which are hard to observe, um, uh, where you will have to vary that what you need to do is, is to do so consciously uh, and professionally and be prepared to justify why you did it that way. Uh, because uh, these, uh, these elements of competency and the units of competency are, are not yet perfect. I don't know if they ever will be. Um, uh, and so you need to be able to work around those where you, where you can. But the starting point is to assume that all performance criteria should be assessed together. Uh, that should be your starting point. <clears throat> and we're going to pick that up under assessment mapping. Uh, Annette has and made that point here. Um, uh, as, but, uh, it, but it is okay, she's saying in her comment, to fragment knowledge evidence. And basically, uh, we're going to get to that knowledge now, uh, but basically the knowledge e evidence items are unique uh, components. They are separate components. You would want them to be integrated in the learner's mind and you would want them to be connected back to the elements of performance criteria in the learner's mind, uh, but when it comes to assessing them, they are separate components and you can assess them separately and if you have to reassess them, there's something which we might talk about next time, uh, you could reassess them separately. Uh, when, when it comes to elements of competency, you must assess the performance criteria together if you can. Uh, and when it comes to reassessment, you would have to reassess the whole element again, not just bits of it. Uh, and uh, that makes a, 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 another difference between knowledge evidence, which is largely piecemeal, uh, and, and uh, evidence of elements, which is not piecemeal, but is collective of performance criteria. So can we move on now to the next slide to look at knowledge itself? Um, uh, as I mentioned before, there was some sort of thought in the very early days of the competency uh, approach uh, that knowledge would not be part of competency. And indeed, initially, uh, under the, what was then the National Training Board, uh, units of competency were written without reference to knowledge. Uh, it was seen that, um, uh, that knowledge was the business of universities and skills was the university of vet, uh, was, the, uh, was the business of vet. Um, rather silly little uh, uh, distinction to make. There is a distinction though, that in the higher education sector, 
uh, knowledge is the key idea. Uh, and so universities are charged with the responsibility of, of teaching knowledge, of de developing knowledge through research, uh, of storing knowledge through libraries. Uh, you know, in other words, they're very much knowledge focused. When it comes to skills in higher education at universities, the skill is there to enhance knowledge. So you learn to be a historian so you can advance the knowledge of history. So the skill is a servant of the knowledge. Knowledge is the master and the skill is there to help you expand and for that matter teach uh, and distribute knowledge. In the vet sector it's completely reversed. By that I mean the skill is the thing that matters. It's not that the person knows how to install a dishwasher, it's that the person can install a dishwasher and does install a dishwasher. Uh, and, and fundamentally it means that the skill is what matters not the knowledge. But the knowledge is still needed because you need to know how to install that dishwasher. You need to know what kinds of different installation procedures there will be. You need to know what kind of different kinds of dishwashers there will be. You need to, need to know about what different kinds of services are available uh, to be installed. And so fundamentally what we see there is the skill is the master and knowledge is the servant. The knowledge is there to support uh, the skill. So we do have a distinction between higher education and VET uh, in relation to knowledge and skills. And in our game, knowledge is a servant of the skill and the skill is the master. So the functions of knowledge are firstly to support the elements of competency. Uh, it's there in order to make sure that the elements themselves uh, have meaning to the students that are learning them. And so quite often, the Knowledge will be terminology, which is terminology used in the elements and performance criteria. Uh, in other words, it's just knowing what this stuff means. But also when it comes to taking a collection of elements and a unit of competency in a whole, as a whole, we need to understand how these things work together to produce a meaningful outcome. How do skills and tasks actually work? Uh, so there's knowledge of procedure and knowledge of process knowledge of function and form. Uh, so knowledge now becomes more than just knowing the names of things, just understanding what things are, but understanding how things work. Uh, so there's that knowledge which is important as well. And you can see that we might have a list of items in our knowledge list, but they all do map back into the elements of performance criteria. That's important because when it comes to writing your knowledge tests, you need to be asking yourself the question, what do they need to know under this heading in relation to performance of this skill? I mentioned to you before there was a section on application in the unit of competency. Ask yourself the question, what knowledge do they need to have to be able to apply this skill in the workplace? Now the list of knowledge is given to you, but interpreting that list means you need to have those sorts of thoughts about how knowledge works. Uh, coping with contingencies. Uh, uh, things can go wrong. You're installing the dishwasher and you discover there's a problem. Uh, um, uh, and when you uh, uh, deal with that problem, you may have to call on knowledge to make adjustments, to change things a bit, even to maybe to vary a bit from the instructions that came with the dishwasher so that you can cope with things that are not working as you expected. That requires knowledge. Otherwise, all you'll do is use brute force and I'm going to make it happen. No, no, if you, the knowledge tells you that you can think of other ways of making it happen, ways of, of succeeding with the task. So coping with contingencies requires knowledge. Otherwise, people who just brutally attack the problem in the same old way every time, uh, rather than thinking it through, if you like. Transfer to other units of competency is important. That a unit of competency has meaning within itself, but it really is something you do on its own. You quite often you do a number of units of competency simultaneously. And what that requires is knowledge, knowledge about how this unit of competency relates to other units of competency. Knowledge about how this unit of competency is applied by yourself and others in the workplace. Um, so knowledge contributes to transfer. And knowledge can contribute to transfer to other workplaces. In the mining industry, it's very dangerous to think that you can only teach a person how 
to operate with the particular machinery in that mine site, the particular procedures and processes of that mine site, because the qualification they're getting is not for that mine site. It's a national qualification for all mine sites. It might be a distinction, and there is a distinction between underground mining and open mining, but nonetheless, uh, uh, what we are seeing is uh, a competencies that apply across different equipment, different protocols, different working conditions, different environments. Now, you can't see that at that mine site when it comes to the skill, but you can teach that and assess that when it comes to knowledge. So the knowledge enables you to take the person both in the training and in the assessment out of where they are into other contexts. What would you, what, how are things different if you're dealing with a sandy site or a rocky site or a clay site? Uh, how, is it, how are things different if you're dealing with this mineral or that mineral or this equipment or that equipment? In other words, knowledge enables you to lift the experience of learning and assessment out of the context in which they're placed. That's different to skills because skills are going to be definitely seen within a particular context. Uh, but when it comes to knowledge, you can go to a broader context, and that's really one of the powerful things about this. Because these are national qualifications, the knowledge has to be national. And again, it goes back to your uh, current industry skills and knowledge uh, requirement in the standards. It means that when you are, as a trainer and assessor, you represent all of industry and the whole knowledge base of industry. Uh, and all the different variations and kinds of industry, um, that does mean that you have to be knowledgeable much or more uh, broadly than just where you work. Uh, and that really is important. Uh, it does mean that you need to look at, and the standard 1.5 talks about industry engagement and industry consultation, as does standard 1.6. It means that you need to get out uh, and understand what is going on within the world of industry much more broadly than just your own. And then transfer to other times, past and future. A bit difficult to deal with the future. We don't entirely know what's going to happen. Um, but in the past, we do know what has happened. And you need to know that your, your graduates may end up working in organisations that are using old equipment or old protocols um, uh, they may not be all state of the art. Your training and assessment might be state of the art, but you need to prepare your students for any kind, uh, as graduates, for any kind of work environment that they might encounter. So you might need to reflect on the past, and you might want to speculate about the future because all of your graduates are going to be working in the future. Um, so you can do that with knowledge. You can't do that with skills because the future hasn't happened. And you can't do that with skills in the sense that you can't necessarily have uh, all the old equipment lying around to demonstrate how things were done. Uh, but uh, you can use knowledge to lift a person back into the past or up into the future. Uh, and finally, you can use knowledge to develop industry understanding. What really is important is that uh, a person understands uh, and gets the feeling of being part of an industry. That's again part of your industry skills. So you bring to this process of gathering evidence about knowledge, and not just the list of the, in the unit of competency, but also you bring your current industry skills. Uh, and what you need to be able to do is to say, I have, uh, I have considered uh, all the different sort of ramifications that industry represents. Uh, I can understand what this unit of competency is requiring, and I can and ask knowledge questions that reflect that broadness uh, that um, uh, enriches the learner and, and enhances the quality of the judgment you make. So when it comes to assessment of knowledge, uh, the process is not so much uh, uncomplicated because um, you do have to think about uh, all of those issues. Uh, but it is relatively straightforward. First thing we would recommend, and again, this is not mandated, but it's recommended, is that you use short answer questions, not multiple guess questions. Oh, look, I'm giving away a bit of my bias here. I've said multiple guess instead of multiple choice. Um, but the truth is that um, in real life, a person is not provided with multiple choices. In real life, a person is presented with an issue to which they need to apply knowledge. Uh, 
Uh, in other words, they get a short question of some kind. Uh, how do I use this bit of equipment is a short question, uh, to which comes, comes a, an answer. Uh, they're not told, uh, they're not given a set of multiple choice questions. Uh, and so multiple choice rarely, uh, perhaps almost never, reflects what happens in industry. So think about how knowledge is used in the workplace. And, and you almost certainly are never going to find that knowledge is used in a multiple choice kind of format in the workplace. You need to make sure that every item of knowledge is evidenced. And it goes back to this 100% thing that uh, was being talked about before as, as one of the questions. You must measure every bit of knowledge. But within each measurement, do you need to have 100%? That's another question which you will need to reflect on in relation to what industry expects. But you have to measure 100% of knowledge. So every item of knowledge listed in the evident, knowledge evidence must be observed through uh, question and answer. Make sure the questions are at the right AQF level. Now, it's true to say that a unit of competency does not have an AQF level. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that was something that was valuable. It's just my personal opinion. Um, but it does have a level of sophistication. And that level of sophistica sophistication is implicit in the application. Uh, is it under, the, under supervision or not, for example? It's implicit in the elements of competency. What kind of skills are they exercising and what kind of autonomy are they exercising with those skills? Uh, it's evident in the performance evidence. Um, uh, you know, how often do they have to do this? Um, with what sort of range of clients or pick up my example before, what range of dishwashers do you, might you need to see them work with? So that tells you the sort of level of sophistication of the unit of competency. Make sure your questions then reflect that. So if, if the unit of competency is very simple, your knowledge questions are likely to be just labelling or naming things. But if your, if your unit of competency is very sophisticated, your knowledge questions will be much more sophisticated. They'll be talking much more about processes and procedures and relationships between things, not just the names of things. So make sure your questions are at the right AQF level. This is tricky for you because you are an expert in your field and you're way up here in terms of your knowledge. I'm not talking about dumbing it down, but you need to make sure the questions you ask are not the questions you'd like to answer, but they're the questions that the student needs to answer in order to be able to demonstrate that they have the competency as it's spelled out in the unit of competency. Make sure that the context and content of all the questions are relevant to the unit and reflect current industry practices. And this is partly to make sure that you contextualise the questions uh, so that they have meaning in relation to the world of work. And again, that draws heavily upon your current industry skills. And then finally, write questions that extend beyond the local context that basically ask you to think about uh, uh, the knowledge required, not just at your particular work site or in your particular RTO or in your particular region, but a need to think about this as a national qualification. You don't know where your graduates are going to go. You don't know which state they're going to end up working in. You don't know what region in Western Australia they're going to be working in. Uh, you don't know what facet or niche of industry they're going to be working in. Under those circumstances, you need to make sure that you've asked questions which give you confidence that the person can effectively work in that wider range of contexts. So you can see knowledge is not trivial. It really matters, and so you need to spend some time making sure you write good knowledge questions. We come to activity one, uh, and that's the next slide. Uh, and in activity one, you have 11 questions. Um, uh, there's a 12th one there for, for you to put your own idea in if you want to. Uh, but on the in the, the uh, left-hand column, just the numbers, in the next left-hand column are knowledge evidence items, which is the knowledge evidence item from, uh, from uh, an imagined unit of competency. Uh, and then there are draft knowledge questions. Uh, now these are just there for you to look at. And fundamentally what we'd like you to do is to look at the uh, knowledge evidence item and the draft knowledge question and say, well, does it look like a good one? For example, the first one, knowledge of food safety strategies in a commercial kitchen. 
Um, and the uh, question is, explain why food safety is important in the hospitality industry, 100 words. Now, this is a real question um, that it was mapped to that particular knowledge evidence item. What's wrong with that? Well, for a start, the question doesn't match the, the, the item. It says, do they know food strategy, safety strategies? Do they know food safety strategies? That's much more than, and much more detailed than why food safety is important. Why food safety important is not going to necessarily tell you that they know food safety strategies. So straight away, the draft knowledge questions not going to tell you much about that particular knowledge item. Not only that, but they have to write 100 words. That's essay writing. They may not be very good at writing an essay about food safety. So what you're now doing is saying, well, if you're good at writing essays, you'll get a better mark or a better, you're more likely to be judged as successful than if you're not good at writing a 100-word 100 100 essay or paragraph. So straight away, we have a problem with that first example of a draft knowledge question. It's not measuring what it's supposed to measure, and it is asking a person to demonstrate skills which are not relevant to the particular, competent, the particular uh, knowledge item. Take a bit of time now to have a look at 2 through to um, uh, uh, 11, uh, and we're going to sort of think of this in two ways. One is that I'd like you to, to take 15 minutes break. Uh, in other words, not thinking about this particular issue. And I'd also want you to spend about 10 minutes looking at those, those examples. So in 25 minutes, uh, if we can reconvene, uh, and I make that around about half past 10, um, if we could reconvene at half past 10, uh, and if you could provide some comments back to us uh, through the chat box, uh, that would be really good. Uh, on and just indicate, you know, item number three, uh, what's wrong with the suggested knowledge question. All of these, um, uh, or at least most of them, are a bit iffy. Uh, a few of them are uh, okay, uh, but most of them are a bit iffy. And what I'd like you to do is to see if you can spot uh, in those uh, draft knowledge questions uh, what sort of problems might arise uh, with them as questions. Let's take that break now and reconvene at half past 10. Okay, folks, uh, welcome back. I hope you had a refreshing break and a constructive one. And I do appreciate uh, that we've had some feedback, uh, which you probably can see on the screen. Uh, but there are a few comments and questions that uh, I just need to pick up on before we move on and look specifically at activity one, uh, because Mark has um, uh, clarified further from his client the concern about uh, amount of training. And indeed, what the client is talking about is volume of learning. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's an interesting concept of volume of learning. Um, I'm referring to a fact sheet produced by the Training Accreditation Council on the amount of training. Um, and it draws a distinction uh, on page three between volume of learning um, and other, other sort of related um, components. For example, um, we have a whole bunch of measures of duration. We have duration, which is the start date and the end date of the course. We have volume of learning, which I'll come back to in a moment. We have nominal hours, which is the amount of time uh, for funding purposes that uh, are involved by the trainer. Uh, but we have also amount of, of, of training, which is the amount of time that a learner's brain is engaged in the learning of that particular uh, unit of competency. And when you add it across all the units of competency, it gives you an amount of training for a whole qualification. The amount of training as a, a measure of the engagement of the learner's mind includes things like obviously class activities where you hope, dearly hope, um, as I am now, uh, that your mind is engaged. <laughs> Uh, then there's uh, pre-reading that a person might, either you might prescribe, and there's follow-up reading which you might prescribe. Um, if these things are prescribed, they add to the amount of training. 
Um, other kinds of activities like workplace experiences might be prescribed, in which case that would amount to the, uh, add to the amount of training. Um, you could, if you want to, include assessment time uh, in, in the amount of training, although strictly speaking assessment is not training, it is part of the training process. Um, and so you could add the assessment time into the amount of training. So the amount of training is the amount of engagement of, of a typical learner's mind uh, in terms of hours, uh, that, that, and that's a, a sort of contract between you and the learner. You're basically saying, if you're undertaking this unit of competency, I, I own your brain for this much time. If a person's a fast learner, they'll take less training time, a less amount of training. If a person's struggling a bit, they might take more of an amount of training. So amount of training is the time of engagement of the learner's mind. Volume of learning is quite different. Volume of learning is a kind of global figure given in terms, usually in terms of years, you know, half a year to two years or something for a qualification. And it, it's really something, volume of learning is really something that is part of the process of having a qualification accredited. Uh, so when an organisation puts up to TAC and says, I want to have this certificate for accredited, TAC will want to say, is the volume of learning, the sort of gross figure of, uh, of time that a person would take to get to this certificate for or diploma or whatever, is that seem appropriate in terms of kind of bulk? Um, it's not as, as precise as the amount of training, it's not as, it's not as, it is a very much more global figure. So volume of learning is used to justify that something should be a certificate three or a certificate four or a diploma. You as an RTO, don't have to justify the, the volume of learning because that's part of the process of getting the qualification recognised. And indeed, you do not have any responsibilities in the standards to relate to the volume of learning at all. The volume of learning does not come up as a standard in the standards. So you can ignore volume of learning utterly because if you're doing what the qualification says, then it will follow that the volume of learning will automatically flow. Uh, it's part of the accreditation process, not part of your responsibility. Your responsibility is to make sure that there is a sufficient amount of training, that is engagement of the student's mind, to be able to learn and acquire and achieve the outcomes associated with a particular unit of competency. So I'm going to say to you, and indeed this what this says in, in, in a sense, is you don't have to worry about the volume of learning. In fact, don't even talk about it. Don't put it in your training and assessment strategies. Put an amount of training in your training and assessment strategies because that's where you make a commitment to the time of engagement that a student's going to need to make in order to achieve it. Now, amount of training, as we've said already, will vary, as indeed volume of learning varies. I mean, volume of learning will talk about half a year to four to two years. What's going on? Well, I mean, it's recognising the fact that people will come in with pre or prior learning and all sorts of things. It's a very global, diffuse kind of figure, whereas amount of training is something that, that involves an analysis by you of the particular learning and teaching strategies that you're using and what that means for the learners that you're dealing with. So don't worry about volume of learning. Um, if something says it's going to take six months and you're going to do it in four months, it's not a big issue because if the amount of training is sufficient for a person to achieve it, you're fine. Um, so I'm just going to suggest that you don't worry about volume of learning, focus on amount of training. That's what the standards ask for and that's where you do that detailed close analysis of, uh, of a person's um, uh, readiness to learn. Uh, which may mean that the amount of training has to get extended or it may mean that the amount of training can be truncated. In activity one, um, if we can go back to that slide again, well, uh, oh yes, very big, beg your pardon, thank you, uh, Mel. Uh, Joe Berry has also asked a question. Can I ask a number of questions that address a single aspect of knowledge evidence? For a start, let me say, Joe, yes, because uh, uh, what you are doing is making sure that aspect of knowledge evidence is being assessed and accept not all questions being answered correctly or is that considered over assessing. Look, there might be lots of reasons why you'd ask a number of different questions. It might be that, that this particular item of knowledge uh, 
has different expressions in different aspects of industry, in which case you might ask a number of questions because you want to say, well, they won't necessarily know all of this, but if they know half of it, I'll be happy. Um, uh, so you're not choosing between knowledge items. Every knowledge item is being measured, but within a knowledge item, you're asking multiple questions because there may be different ways of knowing. In that case, you would not be over assessing, Joe. What you would be doing is basically saying, oh, well, um, uh, different students will have different aspects of this knowledge. As long as they have some aspects of this knowledge, I'm comfortable that they've got the knowledge. On the other hand, you might ask five questions in relation or whatever to the knowledge item because there are five aspects of evidence that, or of knowledge that must be known by a student. In which case you would say, I need all five. I'm not happy with just four. I'm not happy with three. I need all five. And that's why I would say you go back to the industry within you, which you work and ask yourself the question for this unit of competency, how much knowledge does a person need to have? Is it just one question I can ask, or do I need to ask many questions? If it's many questions, do I need to know all the answers, or will some be enough? You, you have to go back to industry and ask yourself that question. I have to say, in fairness, and Joe, um, the challenge that you have there is, is shared by many people, is that the standards as they're written are not very clear about that. Now, when it comes to elements, you know, you're given performance criteria for each element. You're given a set of, you know, four or five or more, sometimes more performance criteria which say this is what you need to look for. It's very precise, very targeted. When it comes to knowledge, it's just a couple of words or maybe even a little sentence, uh, and you have to do some detective work. And I'm going to make a confession here. As an auditor, I can't, because I'm not an expert in your field necessarily, I can't say this is... Uh, enough questions. I can ask you, how do you know it's enough questions? I can legitimately ask that question. Uh, I can legitimately ask, how did you determine to ask five questions and allow for three right? I can ask you that, uh, but I can't say that is right or that is wrong. I can say, yes, you have asked a questions about every bit of knowledge or that you haven't. So from the point of view of compliance, I can only insist that you have questions in relation to every item of knowledge and that whatever you've asked, the person must get right. Uh, in order, in, but the level of performance within each bit of knowledge is something you would need to justify in the context of your industry area. So I could legitimately ask, how did you reach that decision? So Joe, it's a, it's a very good question you ask and um, it's uh, one that's shared by many people. Uh, if I can just walk you through activity one, um, uh, and we won't dwell on this too long, but I do think it, it does illustrate a number of lovely challenges. If we look at um, item two, uh, first of all, it's a multiple choice question. So the, when a person walks into a warehouse, uh, are they faced with a multiple choice question? No, they're not. Uh, so fundamentally, it's as a multiple choice question, uh, it's actually asking them to um, I guess uh, the answer. Uh, quite often all of the above is there because people can't really decide what the right answer is so they make them all right. Uh, so you can see that with multiple choice questions we end up with not a situation where a person demonstrates that they know something, uh, but rather they can make a choice from choices that are not necessarily really offered in a workplace. And of course it depends on the workplace. So that in fact it might be that in some workplaces uh, they don't need to wear PPE in the storage area because there's no forklifts operating in that area or something. What I'm getting at here is the answer might vary from one context to another. And fundamentally, they're only, uh, you're only asking a person to recognise the answer, not to in fact generate the answer. And it's not uncommon to find that people can answer a question correctly if you give them the answer uh, amongst other answers. Uh, which is what multiple choice does, but can't generate the answer from within their mind. Uh, and so you can see that question two doesn't work at really as a measure of knowledge. It might work as a measure of comprehension. It could be useful when, for, for example, when a person's read a bit of text to find out if they've comprehended the text, but to find out if they know, you can't actually use a multiple choice question. Number three, uh, the knowledge question there for number three, 
the AQF level is quite wrong. Um, in this case, they just know the, know, the, know the names of the bones of the foot. This is probably a very low level unit of competency. Um, but describe the typical damage of bones of the foot arising from a football incident is sophisticated. It, it requires more than just knowing the names. It requires knowing and having an understanding of how all of these named bones relate to each other and how they can be impacted one upon the other and so on. So the knowledge question is much higher level and much more sophisticated than the knowledge evidence requirement. In number four, um, uh, and Joe um, uh, Berry uh, makes a comment in relation to this, um, and I also want to, uh, to recognise that Nick Chan's also provided um, feedback on number two. Um, is that number? This question number four narrows the knowledge down to a particular workplace, uh, and and uh, Joe quite rightly says we need to ask a question about workplaces in more general terms. And so a, a, an automotive workshop within which a person works uh, might have very few risks because it's very well managed, or it might have a, range, a large number of risks because it may not well be managed. In other words, um, uh, that is just going to tell you knowledge about a workshop, not rather than about automotive wear, wear, repair workshops in general. And so the question needs to be much broader than it is there. Number five is a double-barrelled bar, double question. Uh, uh, and that's because there's two items of knowledge being measured at the same time. Uh, and the problem is that what do, the, what do you do uh, when they answer the question? Uh, it's much more sensible to provide two questions, uh, so that at least two questions, uh, given the fact that sometimes you might need more, um, but at least two questions to cover two knowledge items, to try to roll them together like that. Um, leaves, it, leaves you with a problem when they get half of it right and half of it wrong, particularly when it comes to things like uh, re remediation or reassessment and so on. Make sure that your knowledge questions are targeting each knowledge item uniquely. Uh, item number six, uh, there's no indication of the level required. Uh, this goes back to the question about over-assessing. List six chemicals used in hairdressing. Do they have to list all six? Uh, do they have to list, uh, and if they do list six, uh, do all of them have to be correct or could some of them be wrong? Um, uh, and it's, you know, what is a chemical even? I mean, water is a chemical. I know that might surprise you, uh, but it is a chemical. Um, uh, so if they list water, would that be counted or not? Uh, what I'm, you see I'm getting at here is that it's too vague and imprecise. Question seven is an interesting one because you find this happening a lot. And it bothers me when, as an auditor when I find it because what's happening here is that they've turned a simple knowledge uh, of a question uh, into uh, something which is, requires essay writing skills. Not only that, but referencing skills, things, things which students take months to learn and is not part of the unit of competency. I have not yet come across a unit of competency that requires a referencing rule being followed. Universities do need to be uh, acknowledged, um, but when it comes to VET, we don't we, we don't have to acknowledge the source. We have to do it right, and we all the knowledge we gather uh, in performing a skill is knowledge developed by somebody else. We spend all that time acknowledging sources. We don't have to do that because the knowledge is not the attribute we're interested in, it's the skill we're interested in. So this business about referencing, um, as long as the person doesn't claim that it's knowledge of their own invention, of their own making, uh, then it's not plagiarism. Saying someone else's word is not plagiarism unless you claim it's your own words. Um, but um, as soon as you, if you don't claim it to be your own words, then it's knowledge that you can legitimately repeat. Uh, I can tell you that uh, today the Prime Minister of England resigned. I don't have to acknowledge the source of that evidence uh, in detail. Um, uh, I would have to if I was making some sort of legal case or writing a paper, but I'm not doing that, I'm just telling you. Uh, and that's information that comes from a range of sources and I don't have to spell out all the detail for, for, for you to, to accept that as information. Uh, number eight, 
knowledge of different types of evidence. Um, uh, basically, all that the uh, question does is repeat the knowledge evidence item. It's not contextualised. It hasn't been put into some sort of uh, everyday language, and it would be really valuable if it was if it goes on a bit. So, knowledge of the rules of evidence uh, um, uh, in, in question eight is just a bigger part. Knowledge of different types of evidence in question eight. It's just we need to go on and say we might need to go on and ask a, 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 a more meaningful question than just repeating the knowledge evidence item itself. Number nine um, it looks okay, um, but the explanation uh, of uh, that is involved um, it, it could well be the next AQF level. So with knowledge of the rules of evidence, list the rules of evidence as soon as we say and provide a brief explanation for each. We have perhaps lifted it up. On the other hand, this is probably a certificate four unit, in which case an explanation would be legitimate. So you have to think about it. If it was a certificate three unit, um, then it might not be. It might be enough just to know the names of the rules. On the other hand, if we look at number ten, uh, it looks quite okay. Um, knowledge of the rules of evidence are validity, authenticity, currency and sufficiency. Provide one example of each and how a person contributing to assessment might meet these rules. Now we're getting into what would be a certificate for unit of competency and we're looking now for examples and illustrations which would reflect that. So uh, if, and if you look at the final one, uh, knowledge of potential barriers and processes related to evidence gathering procedures and assessment processes, you can see that the question only deals with part of the standard. All we're trying to do here is to draw your attention to the fact that it's awfully easy to write bad knowledge questions, and indeed, um, uh, it just means that you need to uh, to to think it through, uh, think about the role of knowledge. Go back to the, I don't want you now to do it, but go back to that slide which talks about the function of knowledge, and ask yourself the question in in asking these questions about these knowledge evidence items, am I in fact exploring all of the ways in which knowledge can contribute to the effective performance of this unit of competency. Am I pitching it at the right level? Am I covering the right contact content? Am I using this uh, uh, measuring and assessing knowledge which contributes to the performance of the skill? And if I'm doing all those things, then I'm probably on the right track. Um, so that the uh, we end up with a, a uh, an indicator of a person's knowledge base that underpins the skills, which is our next focus of attention. Kerry asks the question, if we ask multiple questions on each knowledge area, then as long as the learner answers one of the knowledge area questions right, then we can regard the learner as competent. Um, uh, look, from a point of view of compliance, yes, because that's all that you're asked to do. Uh, but uh, from the point of view of knowing if one answer is enough, Go back to industry. I, I really want you to get that um, uh, well founded in your mind that the ultimate arbiter of of whether this is a knowledge good knowledge question and how many they have to get right is industry itself. Uh, and so you and you need to remind yourself that you are going to make a judgment that this person is competent. You need to be conf confident that the judgment you make on the basis of knowledge and skills, but now just looking at knowledge, that in actual fact the knowledge is going to be uh, sufficient for them to be able to operate uh, and in terms of the definition of competency. It's, the questions are industry related, uh, they reflect the range of industries within which those person might work, they reflect meaningfully on the level of sophistication of the unit and the content of the unit, and then you've nailed it. Um, in your materials, you'll see a knowledge assessment tool, and I do want to stress here that this is just sort of illustrative. It's not, it's not in any sense mandating what you need to be able to do. Uh, but basically, what we're saying is, uh, you know, if if you you need to obviously describe what unit of competency it is, you need to uh, ask for the name of the candidate and the assessor, and and if an evidence gatherer is being used other than the assessor. In other words, the evidence gatherer is a person accumulating evidence on behalf of an assessor. Evidence gatherers don't make judgments, but they do uh, contribute evidence uh, that they have gathered in a meaningful way for an assessor to make a judgment. And then you'd need to put their name down, uh, dates of assessment, 
and you would need to indicate what unit requirements were being assessed. And in this particular case, you would list uh, the uh, evidence with this. In this particular case, the knowledge evidence requirements. Uh, and in this uh, this example, there are ten, uh, or that we can only see, we can see ten um, uh, evidence requ uh, evidence requirements. Uh, now, some people say, "Oh, well, this means the student can cheat." None of this stuff should be secret. Uh, one of the things about uh, um, uh, competencies is that the competencies are publicly known. The student can access that information. And indeed, shouldn't have to because you should have already told them. These are the skills I want you to acquire. This is the knowledge I want to acquire. And you want the student to go out and cheat desperately by learning all those things, <laughs> by becoming skilled and becoming knowledgeable. So it's not supposed to be a secret process. It's supposed to be an open process through which the student can deliberately become competent through learning skills and acquiring knowledge. So listing the knowledge is not uh, in some way or other giving it away. Um, it's, uh, it's actually saying, uh, I am focused, I am targeted, I am committed to this knowledge set, and there are 10 items there. Then, of course, you give instructions for the evidence gatherer, so you have uh, for the evidence gatherer time allowed venue requirements. Uh, whether or not it's open book or closed book. And I might just say in relation to that, ask yourself what happens in industry. If in industry the person can stop while doing what they're doing and go and look up a manual, then it can be open book. But if in industry the guy's driving a bit of machinery and cannot stop and look at a manual, then it has to be closed book. So ask yourself the question, is this knowledge closed book or open book in industry? It's not about what you're doing in the classroom. It's about what industry does. So how is this knowledge used in industry? Is it used by just knowing, or is it used by going to a resource and, and referencing that resource? Uh, so you have to ask yourself that question, whether it be open book or closed book. Uh, and you might also ask yourself, when under the concept of, of uh, instructions for the evidence gatherer, whether or not it's online or face-to-face. And as soon as you go online, you've got to ask questions about authenticity, because the, who do you know is actually operating the keyboard, answering the questions? How do you know? Getting a person to sign a declaration saying, this is all my own work, is not meaningful at all, because of the, 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 the cheat can fill that in too. Um, so it's not enough for you to say, oh, well, just make a declaration. You need some strategy, and we can talk about this when later on in, the, in another workshop, uh, of authenticating evidence that you're gathering. How do you really know that the evidence you're gathering is true? comes down to instructions to the evidence gatherer, because through the instructions to a, uh, the evidence gatherer, you can make sure that there is some mechanism in place uh, to authenticate evidence that you're gathering when you're not directly observing it. Um, resources to be provided by the candidate, uh, you may put boundaries to that, such as open book and closed book. Uh, allowable access to texts or calculators picks up on the same sort of issue because they're resources. Um, how, do I, how are answers recorded by the evidence gatherer? Do they just tick or cross, or do they have to provide a narrative, uh, a description uh, of what the answer was provided, if indeed they're doing it as an oral assessment? Um, are there constraints on prompting? If the student can the student ask questions? If the student asks a question, can you what to what extent can you answer? Uh, feedback to the candidate. How quickly after the assessment do they get feedback? Can they get a, see, a feedback as they go through, or a feedback at the end? What sort of feedback is legitimate? Supplementary assessment. How is that done? Uh, so you'll see in some that they say, oh well, you know, if it's, if they're not successful, they can redo the assess assessment within two days. Do they have to redo the whole assessment or just the bits they got wrong? Uh, flexibility and reasonable adjustment. Um, uh, can you deliver this in, in writing or, and, or can it be delivered orally? Um, what sort of strategies are legitimate? Can it be done through an interpreter? Quick answer, no, <laughs> because the interpreter would not be there in the workplace. Keep in mind all the time that the ultimate issue is how is this knowledge used in the workplace and how can I make sure that I'm understanding this person's knowledge basis as it would be used in the workplace? And then um, instructions to an evidence gatherer might also reflect on the, the extent to which the evidence gatherer provides you with feedback on how well the assessment tool went. 
And then there would be instructions to the candidate, and you can see that they're pretty well much the same as for the assessor or the evidence gatherer. Um, um, but now you're talking to the candidate, uh, and uh, you would need to make sure that the candidate understood uh, what the boundary conditions were for carrying out the assessment. Um, and then you might provide instructions on how to administer the test, and then you need to provide a rec recording and reporting tool. And I would want to stress here that if you're using third-party evidence gatherers, and we're going to pick up on this next time we meet because we're going to talk about administering and, and uh, the tests and, um, and um, making the assessment judgment. Uh, but basically, with, with, uh, if you're using a third party, uh, such as an, a supervisor or a, an evidence gatherer, um, then you would need them to, and it was an oral assessment, you would need them to write the answers down because they may not be able to make a judgment as to whether the answer was correct or not. It might be something that they just record for you to use as evidence for a judgment in relation to each component. On the other hand, if you've provided the uh, evidence gatherer with a marking guide, uh, then they can relate the marking guide answers to the answers the student's given. If they're correct, they can tick yes. If they're incorrect, they can tick no. And if they don't know, they can put a question mark for you to make a judgment at some later time. So all we wanted to do with uh, this document is to give you uh, some, some headings that you might want to consider in relation to um, an actual tool. So let's have a look now at um, uh, the next bit, which is gathering evidence of skills. And what I need to stress now is that we move away from the oral and written stuff, and this, of course, the skill itself is oral or written. Um, so me standing up and presenting is an oral presentation skill. So that's going to be oral. Um, uh, but what you're looking at is a performance. So the performance of a task is used to reveal the skill. It's not like knowledge because the person is actually doing something which you can then uh, monitor, observe, and rate. Uh, and when it comes to this skill, we need to start asking ourselves the question, how often do you need to assess? And I'm going to do a little drawing on the board uh, to illustrate the sort of things that you might uh, need to consider when it comes to assessment. Uh, if we draw these lines, and, and what we're talking about here is uh, proficiency in a, in a kind of global sense, and here we're talking about time, uh, um, uh, we might think of a person, a development of, of a competency from zero, uh, and it, it climbs as they go through instruction. Uh, if there was some sort of criterion point at which you could say there was comp they were competent, above that line they're competent, below the line they're not yet competent. So this is the point at which they achieve some sort of measure of competence. Uh, uh, and, and what we're seeing there is a, a, a threshold that's passed. Now, I do want to stress here that it's not necessarily uh, as simple as this because competencies are multidimensional, whereas what we've got here is a sort of single dimension. But I just want you to illustrate the point. If we carry out an assessment at this point, uh, then the, clearly the person would be judged to be competent. Uh, so at this time we carry out an assessment, I'll just call it A, and we judge the person to be competent. But what was the problem now is that we don't know if that competency is transferable because it's a one-shot assessment. We don't know if in over time performance will decline uh, below the threshold and so that what we have is a situation where they were competent at the time of assessment but may not be competent at some future time. But so carrying out a single assessment doesn't tell us whether they can transfer, doesn't tell us whether they can retain, doesn't tell us that there's consistency. In other words, it doesn't tell us much about the skill at all. So if we carry out a second assessment, A2, and we can now call that A1, then what we are telling the student is not only you have to retain this competency over a period of time, that means they're more likely to put the competencies or the skill into long-term memory rather than short-term memory. And it does mean that the decay curve will be less and hopefully will be retained above the threshold. Uh, so that they, fundamentally they are actually retain their level of competence over a period of time. So having a second assessment, one and then assessment two, means that students are more likely 
to put it into long-term memory and therefore more likely to retain that level of performance, uh, which is good if you're going to make a prediction about their future. Not only that, but if you make A1 and A2 different assessments, I don't mean different methods of assessment. In the case of a skill, they're likely to be still observations, but you might vary something. You might vary the equipment, you might vary the materials, you might vary uh, the protocols, That you'll vary something. What you will see is transfer. So A1 and A2 tell you about transfer, which is one of the definitions of competency. Uh, so if they demonstrate it twice in two different contexts, you've seen transfer. If they demonstrate it twice, uh, you've seen consistency. Uh, and if you demonstrate it twice, you are more likely to be able to say, I have sufficient evidence. So you've demonstrated sufficiency. In some areas, like in hospitality, A2 goes on to be A3, A4, A5, A6, A7, because there are lots of different variations and lots of different conditions can change. And so in something like hospitality, m m many more than two assessments are going to be needed. Uh, so if it says at least once, I would recommend that you interpret that to mean twice, because that way you at least cover consistency, transfer, and retention. Uh, if it says uh, you know, three different um, uh, patients, for example, in a, in a nursing qualification, uh, then you're going to need to do three assessments. Uh, but you'll need to make sure that the three uh, patients are different, not the same patient three times, not the one patient with three observers, uh, but three different patients presenting with three different conditions. Uh, that way you pick up the requirements of the performance evidence, you pick up transfer, you pick up consistency and the like. So uh, when you need to look at what the unit has to say. And if it says at least once, I would recommend that you interpret that as twice, uh, because that way you can meet the definition of a unit of competency in terms of transfer uh, over a range of contexts over a period of time and consistency, uh, both of which are parts of the definition of competency. Now, you only have to do that for the skill. You don't have to do that for the knowledge. The knowledge you only need to measure once or enough times for you to be able to see that they've got all the knowledge. Uh, but in the case of skills, because skills are uh, bound by conditions and materials and equipment and circumstances, or in the case of nursing uh, patients, uh, then you do need to measure more than once uh, to, in order to make sure that the range of conditions, and particularly that which is defined in the performance evidence, is actually reflected in what you're doing. So if we go back to the uh, uh, slide, can we do that, uh, Mel? Thank you very much. Successful performance of two or more tasks that use a skill show the candidate has the underlying skill. That's what we're saying here is that you, you get a sense that the skill is there and can be transferred. You pick up on consistency and also on retention. You need to use your industry skills to identify tasks that require the display of all performance criteria for each element. So look at the element of competency and say, can I imagine how this is used. Go to the application part of the unit of competency. That might give you a clue. Uh, but ask yourself the question, on the basis of my industry experience, how can I imagine a task? Now, if you're going into a real workplace, what you'll find is that the task itself carries with it uh, those performance criteria. At least hopefully they will. If it won't uh, carry all of those performance criteria, you're going to have to engineer. Uh, an adjustment to the task in the workplace so that it does. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that sometimes a performance criterion might have to be addressed by a what if question, as I said before. Uh, so um, you either work within a real workplace and find tasks within the real workplace that reflect those performance criteria, or you engineer one through simulation, which is where we're heading uh, shortly in a couple of slides time. And uh, you may not be able to think of one task that measures all the elements. I mean, an element might be made up of, a unit might be made up of elements that, that uh, relate to sort of development of something, implementation of something, review and evaluation of something. Those might be three different phases of the performance of the task that occur over a longer period of time, in which case you might measure element one first, 
and all its performance criteria. Then you might measure element two second uh, and its performance criteria, and you might measure element three later on. I mean, that's legitimate. You can do that with units of competency. You can treat the elements as separate. You just can't treat the performance criteria as separate. When we get to the uh, further on the evidence gathering and the next slide, um, it basically says that make sure that the tasks you set are at the right AQF level. And again, I understand that units don't necessarily have AQF levels. Some some training packages still do assign AQF levels to them. Uh, but make sure you don't introduce so much complexity that the skill is lost in the process. Uh, and, and fundamentally, you need to ask yourself the question, if this is a, a certificate one unit uh, or a unit from a certificate one, I just want to see that a person can follow set procedures. Nothing unexpected is going to happen or everything is predictable. But if it's a certificate three, a unit from a certificate three qualification, I'm going to expect this person to be able to exercise a good fair bit of autonomy. Things are going to happen that are not entirely predictable uh, and they're going to have to be able to deal with it. If it's a diploma level unit or at least a unit from a diploma, I'm going to expect some creativity and imagination and, um, and uh, some uh, initiative uh, from this person that I wouldn't see otherwise. So make sure that the skills set to the level of sophistication of the qualification within which that is embedded. But I do need to stress here again that um, units don't jump up and down depending on the qualification in which they're placed. So you need to ask yourself them, this might be a unit that's been taken from a, a lower level qualification, in which case I need to make sure that this unit is assessed at that level of sophistication. It's a little bit awkward these days because we do not have an AQF level assigned, um, uh, which means that it's, it's hard harder for people to interpret uh, exactly how much sophistication should be embedded in the skill. But think it through. Uh, think about how the skill is used in industry. Think about it, the, the uh, unit within the context of the qualification and you should be okay. Then develop an observer checklist. Now keep in mind here the observer is going to be recording what they see which indicates which specific aspects of performance are to be noted because they relate directly to the skill. So the checklist must be made up so that it does not include stuff that is not relevant to the skill because that would be a distraction and might lead to an incorrect judgment. But you need to make sure that everything that needs to be seen in relation to the skill is actually in the checklist. So you will probably map, and we'll come back to this later on, each aspect of an observer checklist to one or more aspects of a, of a, a, a unit of competency. Uh, and that's what we're looking at here with the cross-referencing. So you might in fact say, when I'm observing this particular performance, I'm looking for performance criterion 3.2. Uh, within that one tool would have to be all the performance criteria that came from element 3, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4 and so on, because I have to measure them all together. Uh, but that particular item in the observer checklist might relate to just one performance criterion. Uh, and that sort of mapping is what something we're going to look at, at after our next break. When it comes to gathering evidence of skills though, we may in fact use real workplaces which are, uh, are sensible because the, the, uh, the natural environment for a competency is the workplace. That's where every competency has come from, is from the workplace. So it's legitimate for us to look for them in the workplace. But we may not be able to have access to workplaces, in which case we may need to go to simulation. And if we do go to simulations, we need to make sure those simulations look like workplaces, which means that role plays probably don't look like workplaces unless you can simulate in a role play a workplace. Uh, scenarios, probably not because it doesn't involve the sort of engagement that a person has when reading a scenario that they have when they're actually experiencing what the scenario is describing. Um, and projects and case studies, probably not. Now think again about the workplace and ask yourself the question, is this simulation I have here actually going to require them to perform the task? Not just to talk about the task, but to actually do the task. Is it going to actually engage them in the performance of the task? In real workplaces, things, uh, tasks compete with each other. 
are they going to have to be able to handle a situation where there'll be competing demands on their time so that they can prioritise and, and manage the tasks uh, so that they can perform the task even though there are pressures from other, other, other tasks at the same time. Um, uh, so while I'm running this workshop, if my phone rings, how do I handle that? Obviously, I don't answer the phone, but the point about it is that uh, there will be competing demands on you at all times, and how do you manage that? Uh, contingency management, things will go wrong, such as me not being well able to draw on the whiteboard. So things go wrong, so we adopt a different strategy. The different strategy I draw on this whiteboard, which you may or may not be able to see, and Mel re repeats what I'm drawing on that whiteboard, and we've got a solution. Contingency management is what you see there, and we're able to uh, resolve the problem. That's an important thing, because real workplaces don't happen in precisely managed ways, they are a little bit chaotic, which take us to job environment skills, job role environment skills, which is basically saying that real workplaces are chaotic and unpredictable environments, so you need to make sure your simulation has an element of chaos. Don't put a sign on the door saying, silence, keep out, assessment in progress. Put a sign on the door which says, <coughs> come in and make a nuisance of yourself. Assessment is in process because in real workplaces, people come in and make a nuisance of themselves. What I'm getting at here is you need to make sure that the, the, what's happening in your simulation is like a workplace, uh, so that when the, you're observing them, you can say, uh, uh, when I put them in a real workplace, I will be out, they'll be ready for it. They'll be able to cope with the contingencies, with the pressures, and with the sort of social and chaotic environment of a real workplace. Otherwise, you create the illusion of competence when it's not really there. Uh, and indeed, I do see some places where they use a simulation as a sort of preamble to the real workplace. And in some cases, the simulation is all you can do, in which case you need to make it very, very like a real workplace. The other thing that might happen is that you might use a third party observer. And I just want to comment on that. The third party observers are fine, uh, but you must make sure that they are the people who can actually provide you with meaningful feedback about the performance in terms of your observation checklist. So they must have industry skills. They must know what's going on. They can't be just a naive observer who says, I think that's what's going on. They need to really know that what they're seeing is relevant to the uh, item on the observation checklist. You may therefore need to contextualise the item on the checklist. The checklist on an item might mean something to you, but it may not mean the same thing to someone else. So you have to ask yourself the question, uh, wh what language would they use in industry to describe this? What terminology? What, uh, what are there local uh, uh, lingo that I need to be aware of so that I can cast this observation checklist in a form which we, will be understood by the observer. Uh, and that's what we mean by contextualisation there. Uh, the observer, being ne not necessarily someone who can make an assessment judgment, needs to provide written narrative of what they see. They don't just say tick, cross. Uh, they would have to write down what they saw. If you, on the other hand, provide them with a marking guide, they might be able to tick or cross items on your marking guide. Uh, but they need to also be able to write down some narrative if what they see is not what was on your marking guide because you then have to look at that and make a judgment as to whether or not what, what needed to be seen in actual fact had been seen. And then you must make sure that these people, as observers on your, acting on your behalf, as they are part of the RTO's functions and are part of your quality standards, they need to be uh, un understand that they could be validated. Uh, and through routine validation processes. So I want you to have a look now at activity two, and we're going to take truncate this a bit because I'd like to move at half past 11 onto our final run, if you don't mind. So I'm going to truncate this a little bit. Uh, but what I'd like you to do is look at activity two, and um, what you'll see on activity two is nine scenarios uh, used to carry out assessment of skills. And I want you to look at just two or three of them. I've suggested in the document three, uh, but maybe you won't have time. Uh, and uh, ask yourself the question, uh, would these scenarios work as evidence of skill? 
So the first one is ask the student to describe how they would undertake a task. Is that a measure of a skill? I have to say to you that some people do this and they call it a competency conversation, which is brilliant if competency is about conversation, but if it's about working a lathe, it's not going to be enough. So ask the student to describe how they would undertake a task is going to tell you something, but it's not going to tell you that they have the skill. Uh, it's going to tell you that they can talk about the skill, but not that they actually have the skill. So look at two, three, four, five, all the way down. Uh, some of these work, some of these are good, some of these are really quite hazardous. All of them are commonly found in assessment of skills. And if we could reconvene at 11.30, um, if you want to put any comments up on the screen in this time, uh, please do so. Uh, and then we will look at um, uh, the uh, briefly at five minutes or so at the uh, at the answers that you've you've considered, uh, and then we'll move on to the mapping. Now the mapping bit is really quite important because it's a way in which you can make sure that what you're doing uh, across knowledge and skills is going to faithfully reflect the unit of competency, uh, and we'll have a look at that. At, at about 25 to 12, um, and then at about 5 to 12, we'll re briefly touch on clustered assessment, reasonable adjustment, um, and RPL, knowing that these are things which we can reconsider in later workshops, particularly RPL, because there's a workshop dealing with that on its own uh, later on in February next year. Uh, so let's take a break and reconvene in town. Our final run to the finishing line. Uh, we uh, will be finishing at 12 o'clock, um, so um, I'm going to need to take some of this a little bit uh, more um, aggressively, if you like, uh, than otherwise. Uh, thank you again for feedback. Mel has been providing very useful feedback too. Um, so between the two of us, hopefully we're answering your questions. So I do want to draw your attention to the fact that at the last slide, um, it does give you an email address and, <clears throat> uh, for TAC, uh, to, and you can address any further questions to that TAC email address, uh, and either someone within TAC will answer it, or they'll answer the one for me to provide feedback. I just want to comment on those very quickly. Um, and, and it's really for you to just to decide to what extent what I'm saying makes sense uh, and uh, reflects on what your thoughts were yourself. Uh, so the first one is really measuring knowledge. It's not actually going to measure the skill. So number one is definitely out. And the notion of a, a competency conversation is legitimate in order to find out whether or not you think a person's worth assessing. In other words, if the person can't talk about the skill, there's really no point in going on and assessing the skill. But it is not a substitute for assessing the skill. To assess the skill, you need to see the perform person perform the skill. Number two is interesting, but the trouble with an employer is that they may not have observed the student themselves. Uh, they may not uh, understand the standard that, like you do, keeping in mind that you're very highly qualified to experienced people. The employer might much, probably be much less so. Um, and they may uh, indeed provide an untrue report. They may uh, either be harsh or kind. To so this, the, a reference from an employer is not likely to be useful other than just saying uh, as actual evidence. Using review past evidence of a student's performance in similar tasks on campus, well, it could. Uh, but the context might be different, and so you would need to go back and ask yourself what were the contexts within which this performance was observed, uh, and how similar is the task. Now, it is true that units of competency do overlap, and it's quite possible that there's evidence from an old unit that you can use in a new unit, uh, so long as you believe it's current and authentic and obviously valid. Uh, so you have to explore that possibility. Um, set up a scenario where the student reads about an issue and describes how they would resolve it, it's too artificial. It doesn't 
meet the dimensions of competency, which were the, the five things or four things that I listed before. And it's more of a measure of knowledge. The person is just chatting. It doesn't have the engagement of the actual performance of the skill. Number five, set up a group role play activity where other students are actors and observe the student's performance. It relates to one of the questions asked by one of your uh, participants today, uh, to which Mel has answered. And yes, it could work, but it depends on how well the other students can uh, uh, in, in, inhabit, if you like, the characters that they are playing. Uh, the question that was asked before was about something in aged care. Um, could the students act as old people? Well, maybe they can, maybe they can't. And the, the issue really is going to be uh, how well can they do that. And some RTOs uh, use professional actors in order to achieve that. Um, uh, but what you need to make sure here is that the, uh, the dimensions of competency are met. Uh, and if it's aged care, it'll be the dementia of competency. Uh, and uh, you'll need to make sure that um, that um, uh, th there will be an opportunity to again assess them because you do need to assess twice with real people uh, who are real uh, aged e examples of aged care residents. Uh, so fundamentally, it might be useful as a preliminary assessment, but on its own, it would probably not be enough. Number six and seven and eight will work uh, if, the, if they are um, well managed. Um, uh, and so you could use uh, students uh, as um, actors uh, uh, as long as they meet the dimensions of competency. Uh, you could use professional actors as long as it meets the dimensions of competency. And of course, try and uh, set up a practice workplace or go into a real workplace, in which case you're seeing competency as it really happens. So that's our five minutes and we need to move on. I'm not going to spend time looking at this document, but you've got a copy of it yourself. And like the previous one, what I'm just suggesting you do is have a look at the kind of headings that are offered uh, and ask yourself the question, uh, in my observation checklists, have I referred to all of the different parameters that I need to? I use this not as a, a set of instructions, but as a set of clues or hints or suggestions uh, against which you can um, uh, reflect on your tool. And in particular, um, uh, when it starts talking about how you record observations, have a look at how you're recording them and how it's suggested on that document. But if we move on now to uh, the uh, final part of our workshop, apart from those three special topics, which is mapping the requirements, uh, unit requirements and assessment tools. And I mentioned to you when I showed you this slide earlier, that would come back to this one again. How can you make sure that every requirement is being addressed? How can you make sure you're getting sufficient evidence? How can you be sure that you've not fragmented elements? How can you make sure that you are focused on what is required and don't bring any extra requirements in? Uh, how can you be sure that you're gathering the correct, right, uh, correct form of evidence? And the strategy that we are suggesting you consider is a mapping. Now, I do need to stress that the mapping really is only uh, the first one, two, three, four, five columns. The outcome column and the comment column uh, would be things we're going to talk about next time we meet. Because in February, when we talk about making assessment judgments, and for that matter, keeping assessment records, those two columns become active. So at the moment, we're talking about just about the first five columns. Uh, and on the left-hand side, we have the unit requirement. Uh, elements and performance criteria. Notice that the elements are listed uh, in, uh, and then the performance criteria are listed. I want to stress that this is important. Some people leave out the elements and just list the performance criteria and we lose context of, uh, of what, is we're, what we're talking about. If I was to talk to you about something with legs and had a flat top, you probably assume it means table, but we're not entirely sure. Um, uh, to, I would need to mention the word table and then you know, no, the legs are table legs and not person legs. You know the flat top uh, was uh, uh, something of this kind because the word table helps you interpret what its performance criteria mean. Here in this element one uh, has a set of four performance criteria. And if I just listed the performance criteria, you would not necessarily know what they meant until you see the element. So always make sure the element is listed as well as its performance criteria. Then 
we see uh, them down there for the page, all the way down uh, on the next page. If we can just flip forward and then we'll flip back again, you can see knowledge evidence. So the whole picture is there, but back again to the uh, elements, the foundation skills and the performance evidence. PA1 is the performance evidence and observation one and observation two, observation three and four, five, six, seven and so on are listed there. So there's a whole bunch of observations, up to 12 observations that have been made in performance evidence one, a performance evidence two, performance evidence three. So we're measuring the performance three times. Uh, although you'll notice at the top on the right hand side, it says at least two different activities. So you don't need three performance evidences. There are just three there to make sure that we're getting enough evidence to make a judgment of competency, which is our topic for next week, our next uh, next meet session in, in, in February. And KA is knowledge assessment. Uh, and clearly its function is to measure knowledge evidence. And here you can see a mapping that has been done uh, against each of these. And if you look at page two, you'll see that the, again, the mapping continues, PA1, PA2, PA3, knowledge assessment. Uh, and then what you see is a description of what PA1, PA2 and PA3 and the knowledge assessment are, uh, what the unit, uh, what, uh, what um, uh, aspect is being assessed, uh, what um, the type of assessment is involved, who's doing the assessment and the like. Now, if we go back to the previous page, I need to say to you that there are at least 20 errors in this mapping. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to ask you just to take a few minutes just to look at that. Maybe we'll just say two or three minutes and see how many errors you can find in that. Uh, because there are about 20 things that have gone wrong in terms of what we've been talking about. And then after maybe uh, three minutes, uh, I'll cut back in again and we'll start looking at where things have gone wrong. Okay, well look, um, I noticed Claire has picked up a few bits and pieces and Rebecca uh, and, um, and Car, uh, Kari, Kari, um, it's a bit hard to read your name, Kari, from a distance. Uh, and you are picking up on the problems. So let's have a look at this in detail. And we flip to this one here, which is where we've annotated things. Have a look at our element number one. We, ne we, d we measure element number one in PA3 because there you can see all four performance criteria being measured. But PA1 and PA2 don't measure element one. They measure bits of element one in PA1 and other bits of element one in PA2. But because we haven't seen element one in total until PA3, we've only seen PA3 once, uh, a big part in element one once. Uh, so straight away you can see that PA1 and PA2 don't add up to a, a, a measure of element one, uh, because there are different circumstances. We have not seen all performance criteria at once. So we only have one legitimate measure, PA3, of, of element one. When we look at element two, uh, we actually find some problems. For example, there are words missing. 
Uh, so there, for example, in 2.3, it says it actually says context and candidate characteristics. So straight away, the me the meaning of that performance criterion has been changed. And it could have been a typo. It could have been someone compressing it to fit it on the line. Um, whatever reason, it's changed the meaning and therefore potentially changed the validity of the assessment. But there's a performance criterion missing. 2.4 is entirely missing. You find this happening with people and they, and they need to go back. You need to go back and validate your list of requirements against the unit of competency to make sure you haven't made a mistake. Uh, 4.1, the word decision is incorrect. It should be evidence. Provide evidence to the assessor. In fact, you can't provide the decision to the assessor because the, only the assessor can make the decision. So there, it, it's wrong, a wrong use of the word, and again changes the meaning and invalidates the assessment. Um, if you look at the actual unit of competency and you've been sent a copy of the unit of competency, you'll find that there's no foundation skills. So I, in my enthusiasm, have put in the foundation skill, neat, accurate and prompt reporting. I think that's important, but I'm not allowed to put in my own opinions. I have to follow what the unit of competency says. So you can see if I look down the left-hand column, uh, there are changes to the actual unit of competency. If I start looking down the other columns, I can see that element one, I haven't measured properly. Element two, uh, I have measured properly in PA1, I haven't measured it at all in PA2 or PA3, and then I think I'm measuring it in the knowledge assessment, but it's not true. Though Q7, Q11 and Q13 might relate to those performance criteria, but they are not measures of performance. And so I cannot substitute uh, it, it, that, knowledge, that uh, assessment of performance uh, with knowledge questions. So that's wrong. Uh, so I've only assessed that particular requirement once, and again, I've failed to meet the requirement that I measure twice. There are similar issues with uh, element three. Uh, in element three, apart from errors in, in wording, uh, I've also got uh, a situation there where I'm not making an observation against 3.1 in PA2 for some reason or other, and the Q2, question two, which might relate to it, is not a substitute. Uh, so you see that I can't somehow or other cobble together evidence of different kinds from different places and imagine somehow that I've got the whole story. Uh, if we go down to uh, uh, element four, clearly I'm only measuring it once. Uh, it doesn't meet the requirements. If I go down to performance evidence, uh, I clarify the, uh, uh, the uh, role, uh, I need to see more than just one observation of that. Uh, and and so on. Uh, you can see that there's a, perhaps a typo. Uh, if I'm going to clarify the assessment plan, I need to look at observation six, uh, and I've left that out in that particular case. And uh, number four, I've got to report findings three times. I've only done it twice. Uh, I've seen it twice, and therefore I don't don't meet. It doesn't meet. Uh, uh, and so what you find is that, and there's also O8, uh, an observation that's not actually in there at all, it's not being mapped. As it turns out, it probably relates to 2.4, but it's not being mapped and so we've got a problem. If you flip over the page, uh, you can see more problems of, uh, of a kind. For example, there are knowledge items not assessed. Uh, there is one knowledge item, uh, knowledge item six, which appears to have been assessed by observation, but you do not know uh, that they have covered enough different kinds of evidence from observation of what they did in the actual evidence gathering activity. They might have used different types of evidence, though they might not have. Uh, and under those circumstances, you can't infer that they have the knowledge. So under, uh, you would need a question, no doubt question seven, in which you would have uh, a look at specifically different kinds of evidence. Uh, and then, of course, when you get down to uh, uh, the overall outcome, we're going to come to this later on, but you're not going to be making a judgment of competence um, or uh, at that point, because each of these bits of evidence don't add up on their own to competency. Competency can only be judged when all the evidence is in, but that's a topic for next time. Finally, on this page, you can see that uh, what we've got is the same assessment twice. That is forklift assessed by Bill Smith twice, uh, and that's not adequate, uh, because it said it needs to be different kinds of environments. So if we look at the next slide, we can see everything cleaned up. Now it looks terribly boring uh, because everything is just sort of doing everything. 
But this is the idea of the game. It's not supposed to be uh, particularly uh, weird or wonderful. It's supposed to be pretty straightforward. So we have element one measured three times, element two measured three times, element three measured three times, element four measured three times, all the requirements. Don't worry about the red bits, they should actually be black. Uh, but the point about it is that uh, is that what we are doing is making sure that we address everything. Notice the knowledge evidence column is uh, column is blank because here on this page we're only measuring skills. But if we flip the page, we can see suddenly the knowledge column is populated and the others are blank because now we're measuring knowledge. It's going to be measured by knowledge, question, and answer. And in this particular case, there are ten. Uh, items of evidence and there are 10 questions. You'll notice now that instead of assessing with only with forklift twice, uh, the assessment is going to involve forklift, mobile crane and rigging, three different assessment contexts where this competency is being assessed. Uh, and in that way we have made sure that there's transfer and um, as well as retention because of the multiple assessments. So what you can see here is that we've gone from uh, a mapping which has revealed lots of problems to a mapping which has cleaned up our act to make sure that we get meaningful and precise measures of what we need to see. And, and what I need to stress here is think of this mapping as a dynamic tool. There's no embarrassment at all in getting that first one that we had, blogs A, I think it's called. Uh, there's no embarrassment in that. The embarrassment is if you think that's good enough. <laughs> So what you do is you do the first mapping and you might discover that um, it looks like blog A, in which case you work on it until it looks like blog B. And I want to stress this is really important if you've purchased an assessment tool. If you've purchased an assessment tool or borrowed an assessment tool from somebody else, do the mapping. Because what you will often find is that even though the tool has come from a credible source, in some circumstances even the owner of the training package they will not necessarily have assessed well. That's a bit spooky, uh, but at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to know that the tools you're using work. It is not their responsibility, and indeed, they almost certainly have a pre preamble to the tool which says, we take no responsibility for the quality of this, um, in which case you need yourself to take responsibility for it. Um, if you hire a car, it's your responsibility to make sure the car is roadworthy. If you borrow someone else's assessment, assessment tools, you need to know that the assessment tool is competency worthy. You need to know that what you're using as a tool, whether it's your own invention or whether it's somebody else's invention, you need to know that it is going to work. So do the mapping and when you find that there, if you find there are problems uh, identified through the mapping, then fix them so that you end up with a version that you are very confident will measure everything you need to measure. Uh, under those circumstances, you'll be able to make a safe judgment, which is our topic for next time. So there are three topics I want to touch on just briefly. The first is clustered assessment. And I need to stress here that um, it, clustered assessment is something we encourage. Uh, uh, and clustered delivery is something we encourage. There's a bit of a, a, a bit of a, an issue here. If the cluster is too big, then the person has an enormous task to achieve competency because they've got to achieve three or four competencies all at once, uh, and, and that undermines one of the concepts of competency, which was to make the steps small enough for people to achieve. On the other hand, when you make the steps small, you fragment the, 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 uh, the uh, qualification into a small set of separate competencies and the relationship between competencies may, not, may be lost. So clustering helps you to forge a relationship between competencies, show how they're connected to each other, uh, and quite often the learning environment and the assessment environment lends itself to the performance of more than one competency at a time, in which case clustering can work. So keep in mind you've got, we, you, there's a benefit in clustering in terms of meaningfulness, there's a risk in clustering in terms of making the task so enormous that people are going to find it difficult to achieve. You need to balance that benefit and that risk. If you've decided to cluster, then what you've done is taken two separate units of competency and merged them into a single entity. 
and you can teach it that way, that's perfectly legitimate, and you can gather evidence that way, that's perfectly legitimate, but when it comes to making a judgment, you must make a judgment about this competency independently of that competency. So the evidence can be gathered together, but the judgment has to be made separately. So that means that you will have a mapping for each unit of competency, but the mappings will overlap. So in this, if we were to take this example, PA1 might actually have other observations related to another unit, or there may be even some observations where the units share the same element, uh, or even the same performance criteria which map across. So what you might find is that, uh, is that in a particular assessment, that the assessment measures more than one unit, in which case we'll find mapping, two mappings, I can't dare, oh, I suppose I can hold it up like this, one for one unit and one for the other unit, uh, and uh, what you end up with is conf confidence that although you've merged them into one uh, small set of assessment tools, you have justified them in terms of mapping, independent mappings. And as we'll see next time we meet, uh, that when it comes to making a judgment, you then have to take the evidence from the joint assessments, map them into the separate tools, and then make a judgment for this tool, and then make a judgment for this one, uh, uh, for this uh, unit, and then a judgment for this unit. Because they might achieve one and not the other, they might not achieve either, or they might achieve both. It does mean that you have to make judgments that are separate, and that really becomes an important quality in uh, utilising the assessment mappings, but being able to preserve uh, the independence of the judgments for each unit. Second thing I want to talk about too with you is reasonable adjustment. And uh, reasonable adjustment basically is something that you must offer under the by law. The Commonwealth Government's Disability Discrimination Act, DDA, uh, and there are also parallel state uh, regulations and acts. Uh, require that you provide access where possible, and I want to stress the words where possible, to people who present with a disability. I do need to stress here that reasonable adjustment is not talking about language literacy and numeracy, except if that language literacy and numeracy problem was caused by some sort of disability, like brain damage or, or some uh, uh, chemical or other kind of uh, uh, problem. So fundamentally, the issue is not, um, we're not talking about adjustments that are made for a person who might have uh, a, a, say a cultural or an educational challenge. Um, and what we're talking about here is someone who presents with a disability. And the Act actually talks about defined disabilities. You can see those two words there in the second paragraph, a defined disability. Uh, and that is defined within the Act. Um, if a person presents with a defined disability, you have to make a judgment. You have to make a judgment as to whether or not you can teach this person and assess this person given, the, given that they have that disability. And here again, it goes back to the question of reasonableness. The first thing about reasonableness is that you must not change the meaning or significance of the unit of competency in order to fit the person the unit of competency must not be changed. Uh, so what you might change is how you teach it, you might change how you assess it, but you cannot change what you teach or how you assess, uh, that to, to, uh, or what you assess, because fundamentally, I'll rephrase that, you must not change what you teach or what you assess, but you could change how you teach and how you assess. Uh, you have to also ask yourself the question, Am I making a meaningful judgment about this person's readiness for the workplace? So if you create a situation where in the rarefied atmosphere of your RTO, you can make adjustments that the person uh, is able to demonstrate competence, which can't happen in the workplace, that would not be reasonable. So you have to ask yourself the question, can what I'm doing here be replicated in the workplace? If it can't be, it's not reasonable. Reasonableness also relates to cost. That is, if you as an RTO can't afford the special equipment or the special physical restructuring of the organisation or whatever is involved, it's not reasonable, then you can't do it. And if it's going to impact badly on other students, it's not reasonable. So consider cost, impact on other students, the, the requirements of the unit of competency itself and the requirements of industry. And if you can't offer reasonable 
reasonable adjustment, then you don't accept the student uh, and you're not breaking the law if you don't. However, you must provide the student with a letter saying why you said no. Uh, it, on the other hand, if you say yes, you must provide a student with a letter saying yes, and these are the adjustments we'll make, and then you are committed legally to making those adjustments. So keep in mind what the word reasonable means in the context of this. One of the things we've discovered with a competency-based approach is that we can accommodate people's needs, uh, particularly those with disability, uh, much more effectively than we could in the past, but that does not mean it's open slather. There are still going to be boundaries, and that's where the concept of reasonable adjustment kicks in. The final thing we want to just talk about today is RPL. And I want to stress that in Standard 1.8, it says assessment including RPL, including the recognition of prior learning. And what we need to understand is RPL is not a watered down assessment process. It is the full blown, full power, full uh, uh, requirements of assessment. The rules of assessment must apply, principles of assessment must apply, the rules of evidence must apply. Fundamentally, RPL is not a soft option. What RPL does is excuse the training. It does not excuse assessment. And so we are recognising that they have prior learning and therefore do not need more, more learning. But we are not saying that they are already competent. How can we tell? We, like our own students, we have to do an assessment to find out if that prior learning led to competence. So what you'll need to provide is evidence of competence. Some of that might be from the past, but keep in mind that it has to be current, it has to be authentic, and you have to know it's authentic. It has to be valid, therefore it must be sufficiently detailed for you to know that it is truly about this competency, about not, not something else. It has to be sufficient, which means that the transfer and the variability needs to be, be seen. If you don't know that, then you are going to have to do an assessment yourself, which meets all the rules. In other words, you've created a set of assessment tools, use them for RPL. Now we're going to get into that in some detail in February, uh, but I need to draw your attention to the fact that there is a fact sheet on the recognition of prior learning. And indeed, if we could just uh, finish up with reflecting on the fact sheets, because I've got 40 seconds left. Uh, I need to stress, of course, that there are the standards for RTOs, which I would suggest you look at if you haven't had a chance to look at them in detail. But perhaps the best way to do it is to through the user's guide produced by the Training and Accreditation Council. And there are fact sheets. There's a fact sheet on assessment, which is very much consistent with what we've been talking about today. Uh, there's a fact sheet on assessment validation, which is the topic of our fourth workshop. Uh, but if you don't keep in mind the issue of validity now, uh, then you're going to find problems later on. So it's something you certainly need to look at. Uh, there's an assessment on the re uh, fact sheet on the recognition of prior learning, um, uh, which we are discussing in February again. There's a, a fact sheet on industry engagement, which is one way through which you gather an understanding of industry's requirements when it comes to uh, uh, assessment and the fact that your assessment is judging whether the person is industry ready. There's a fact sheet on identifying and meeting um, learner needs, which helps with issues in relation to coping with variations amongst your students and your candidates. And indeed, one on reasonable adjustment, which deals more specifically with people who present with disability. Uh, and then there's a fact sheet on vocational currency and industry currency, which connects to industry engagement, but also reminds us that it, those qualities are very much necessary if we are building and framing our assessment tools for knowledge and for skills. May I say thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, it's really wonderful to know there are 57 people out there who are engaged with us today, and that is brilliant. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, do draw your attention to the fact that a couple of slides on, well, on the next slide, I think, uh, that there is a, uh, an email address that you can use to contact uh, TAC if you have any particular questions you want to put, put uh, uh, either through TAC to me or something that TAC can deal with themselves immediately. Thank you very much for participating.